Let's start with uh, a widely discussed turn in China right now, the new productive forces. So this turn, which focus heavily on technology-driven growth models is now a focus of discussion by many uh, foreign think tanks and media outlets. So from your perspective, how do you understand this concept and how will it reshape China's future economic growth? Well, you know, if you go back to economics, right, there's two ways that you grow an economy. You add more labor, you add more capital, more money, or you make that labor and capital more efficient via productivity. And technology is one of the secret ingredients that makes productivity bigger and stronger and makes labor and capital more effective. China does have challenges in its growth model. Due to demographics, the labor force is going to shrink. And due to debt, due to deleveraging, due to global capital issues, there's less and less productive capital going into the market. So to re-energize the economy, China does need a new growth model. And new technologies can be very effective in that. Of course, in the simplest way, automation can replace the need for labor. It can make labor more productive. One worker can put together five things at once instead of doing one thing with its own physical body. And if you take a look at the different types of innovations, there's basically three types of innovation driven by technology. One is efficiency, using technology to do the same thing, but to do it better. The second thing is engineering, which is building big complicated things um, and using technology to make the quality better, to make the specs more precise, or to integrate software and hardware together to make a more effective offering. And then the third one is scientific-based innovation, which is where you have true breakthroughs. You create something new. And out of creating something new, uh, you're able to build new industries and create new jobs and new places to put capital. And in all of those, China has excelled, but it's been most effective and has the best global share in efficiency-based industries. That's where China really is tops. There's two ways that innovation going forward can help China. One is to increase China's lead in efficiency-based industries, to help Chinese companies move up the value chain in engineering-based industries, and for China to get its rightful global fair share of scientific-based new industries, which have traditionally been led by the West and by Japan. In all of this, innovation needs to be led by the market, by technologists, and by entrepreneurs, because it's simply too complicated for any third party decision maker like the government to make decisions about which innovations work and which ones don't work. And so the government has a very important role in terms of making China one of the best places for the market, for entrepreneurs and for private capital to invest in the innovations that will matter. And finally, the Chinese government faces the same challenge as all governments around the world in terms of letting technological innovation come into the economy. Innovation inherently is disruptive. It creates problems. It shakes up the status quo. Innovation stands on a table and says, look at me. We're going to do stuff differently now. And whenever you shake up the status quo, entrenched companies, entrenched competitors, entrenched special interests don't want that to happen. And it also shakes up the social fabric. So creating a balance between stability and letting innovation flourish in a disruptive way is a big challenge for China and for the rest of the world. I find it also very interesting in a previous interview, you mentioned that globalizing form for Chinese technology companies has to change. So could you elaborate more on that? So uh, what do you think those Chinese company, technology companies need to do to truly go global? So China's had some very effective globalization models in the past. China has been great in the past at attracting global capital to invest in factories and businesses in China. It's attracted a lot of global capital into China, especially into 
all these emerging internet and AI companies in the past. There's been a lot of global capital flowing into those. And China has been great at making products in China and exporting them to the world. So there's a lot of effective models in the past for China's globalization. But going forward, the rules of globalization are, are gonna change because the value is moving in different directions. When you look at an AI driven world, the value is going to be in digital transformation, in technology services, and in software. And these are areas where China, China being primarily focused on leadership and hardware and physical things has lagged behind the rest of the world. For instance, the software market in the United States is about 50 times larger than the software market in China. And so Chinese companies will need to operate differently going forward to globalize. They will need to adopt new business models. They will need to build up new capabilities. Why do Chinese companies need to globalize? The math is simple. 80% of the technology opportunity, the profit is outside China. You can't win getting most of that 20% where the rest of the world gets the 80%. You have to compete in that global market. But because it's a different way of operating, it's around services, digital transformation, artificial intelligence, Chinese companies will need to adopt global business practices, bring in global culture and bring in global talent. And since there's less and less global talent in the Chinese mainland, Chinese companies will need to go out and be where that talent is globally. And also due to geopolitics, if you want to sell into Europe, if you want to sell into the United States, if you want to sell into India, if you want to sell into these other big markets, you're going to have to place your teams there. You're going to have to put your R&D there. You're going to have to invest in those foreign markets, not just ship products. And this means that Chinese companies need to change how they operate, but they always need, also need to change how they look. Chinese companies, in terms of the percentage of foreign passport holders who sit at the top level of Chinese companies, have the lowest percentage of foreign passport holders in the top leadership of any major country. The leadership is almost entirely Chinese. To more effectively compete globally, they're going to have to bring in top leadership talent and their boardroom, their executive staff is going to have to look like the United Nations, not simply like a Chinese company. That's a big cultural change that these companies will need to go through. So um, we can now talk about AI. I mean, it's now a really hot topic right now. AI is booming in recent years from ChatGPT to the recently launched Sora. Um, if we focus on China, so what tier do you think China is at in terms of this AI development? And what should Chinese company do to seize the opportunities of this AI development as well? So China has an amazing artificial intelligence scene right now. There's so many entrepreneurs, big companies, scientists, all doing stuff to enable this ecosystem here. I think there's something like 275 large language models that have been launched in China. That's an amazing number. There are several startups that have raised more than a billion dollars uh, in order to invest in this space. And all the big companies are doubling down and bring their chatbots and other things to market. And also, in addition, at the core research level, there's actually a lot of uh, Chinese scientists in Chinese universities developing breakthrough research, which is among the most cited and most successful in the world. So there's a lot happening in China today. China, I think, actually faces the same issue as the rest of the world in how to make money off of AI. Right now, most of the money is flowing into GPUs, semiconductors, data centers, and things to make it happen, rather than money paying back that investment. And as I said before, there's a big challenge in China uh, due to the, la the much smaller software size. And since a lot of the AI value creation is via selling software, China needs to think about, or Chinese companies need to think about, how do I monetize software and how do I build a recurring revenue and license stream off of software so I can pay back this AI investment? So there's some industry structural changes that need, need to be underway. And, and, and also in a couple of other areas, uh, there's places where China faces challenges and the rest of the world faces challenges too. One is the adoption of cloud, um, especially software as a service is lower here 
And there's too many clouds that are too segregated. And that means it's difficult to build models and it's difficult to let small companies have access to the models, to the technology, so they can create some great new application on top of it. So a more mature cloud environment and a more portable cloud environment where different clouds can work together could be very powerful. And then finally, there's a lot of great data in China, but a lot of this data is segregated, siloed, not allowed to be accessed by entrepreneurs and private companies. The rules about data transfer are sometimes too onerous or too unclear. And so, and sometimes there's too much government approval required to share the data. And of course, that means that it's only big companies and big groups with lots of lawyers and lots of understanding that are able to get access to this data and do build the models to train the models, et cetera. But it's not clear that big companies are going to be the ones that solve the AI model. A great thing about China is that entrepreneurs and small companies have always made a huge difference. So they need to have more of a level playing field so that they can build up and build out new ideas that grow and scale and create money in AI in China. But China has a lot of great AI talent. It's clearly one of the world's global leaders. And there's a lot of upside going forward. In what areas China and U.S. can work together to set aside some differences in terms of the AI collaborations? There's still a lot of American semiconductors that are flowing in to Chinese companies that are being used to train and build out models. And there's actually a lot of Chinese scientists sitting in the United States helping build new AI capabilities. So in a complicated situation, there's still a lot of collaboration underway, and there's still a lot of business underway. I surveyed a lot of companies recently about how do you choose your technology suppliers? How do you choose your technology partners? What's most important, the performance and the price of the product or geopolitics and where the supplier is from? Everyone chose the performance and the price of the products. So the market still rules here. But there are some challenges and some, it feels like sometimes those challenges are growing every day for a lot of reasons. But there's certain areas which you could say have minimal impact on national security and a lot of upside to humanity if we could work on them together. Disease prevention, pandemic prediction, new green technologies, healthcare, managing satellites and space, space exploration, a lot of things which are either breakthroughs we should share with the world or things where the benefits of collaboration are so high and the national security costs are so low that they should be collaborated on together. So according to uh, a McKinsey analysis, the global market for semiconductors is projected to reach 1 trillion US dollars by 2030. So in this background, in this backdrop, so what is China's strain and advantages in the uh, global semiconductors market? Uh, what should Chinese company do or focus on in terms of chips R&D to adapt to uh, the domestic and the global market from a perspective? Sure. Uh, there's a lot of great Chinese semiconductor companies, and there's a lot of benefits you see today. Chinese semiconductor companies are very strong in design. They're very fast in terms of time to market. They have low cost structures, and they're very good at designing products that have good enough performance, but at a very low cost. And because there's so many end customers in China, they have a lot of closeness to the system manufacturers and are able to very quickly update their products for those system customers' uh, requests. And so that's why you see growth for Chinese uh, semiconductor companies, especially in things like consumer products where the manufacturing base in China is very strong. So there's been a lot of success and a lot of growth in the industry in the last decade. But this industry is ferociously competitive and you can't be good at everything. And Chinese companies today are less than 3% of the chemicals, materials, and semiconductor equipment, 3% global market share that are all go into a semiconductor fab to make the chips. And now that's growing, but it's growing very slowly. You have to think of semiconductors as a collection of niches. Inside a semiconductor fab, there might be 55, 60 different machines. 200 to 300 different chemicals and materials. And even in those categories, there are subcategories and subsegments. 
You win by winning in your niche. And so Chinese companies should be very focused, not about spreading out and trying to compete everywhere where you're going to lose to the leader in each individual segment, but being very focused on the set of segments and the set of products where they can actually be successful and then build from there. That's number one is focus, focus, focus. Number two is patience. The reality is it takes about 10 to 15 years to build a good semiconductor company. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. No one's ever gotten to the top in five years. There are no shortcuts. That means that the government policies, the capital, the leadership, the talent, all needs to be patient. Thirdly, globalization is going to be critical. Nope, semiconductors is pretty much the most challenging things that the most difficult things humanity makes. It's like the pinnacle of human capabilities. There's no way that one country can lead across all segments of the industry. There are going to have to be areas where the Chinese semiconductor industry is going to have to depend on global suppliers and global partners. That's just a reality. 